attention, Duke Masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Fake patients, the tip of the fatberg, and replacing holy water. Plus this day in history with the death of Tupac and our song of the day by Chick 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 on Your Morning Monarchy for September 13th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Good morning. Welcome to wherever you are for another blast of listener-supported media brought to you by you. Streaming live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We got the news stories posted up on the tweets. You got the invite to the chat. Huge thanks to everybody in the chat. A couple seconds after 9 a.m. It is a Wednesday. That's a hump day. That's food, health, and environment news. It's hashtag food world order. Those are the stories we're going to be talking about today. And again, we are brought to you by you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the links to all the ways to support us. From PayPal to Bitcoin to the post office box to Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy. A huge thanks to Floyd H., our latest patron at Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy. That keeps us going and growing, moving and grooving. If you can give a palittle, I can give a palato. I love that. Huge thanks to Misophiliac in the chat for coming up with that little bit of joke that I'll probably take and run with and run it into the ground and you'll later say, God, he says that a lot. Everything we say and play will be included in the show notes, my friends. I've got a delicious, nutritious menu of food, health, and environment news to go over here in just a few moments, but let's glance at the breaking lame stream news, see what's breaking, if I can fix it for you. Five dead at South Florida Nursing Home as state grapples with heat and outages after Irma. Now, our buddy Justin Lewis, who is running Nature Bay, who is being fought by eBay, he's in the Tampa Bay area. Now, I believe I've seen some tweets and some posts, but I haven't actually seen any word. I reached out to him and was like, hey, buddy, you doing okay? Justin, safe? Hopefully, he is probably safe and fine and is probably very busy dealing with friends and family and community. We hope everybody out there is safe and sound. We've been on fire up here in the Pacific Northwest. Everybody's underwater down in the South. Single payer pushes the health care debate decidedly leftward. One way Clinton misunderstands the political moment, most Americans aren't in the middle. That's from the Washington Compost as the Hillary hoopla heats up. We'll probably talk about that a little bit on Friday as she's, of course, going on her big book tour. It's called the Blame Everyone Tour. And again, you can see the fickle nature. You've already got people on the lift going, oh, God, I wish she'd shut up and go away. Florida prepares for days and maybe weeks without power. What? what? My power? My government? You mean they're not going to be there when the rubber hits the road and they actually need them? Yeah, that's exactly when they're not going to be there. And that's exactly when you shouldn't rely on them. And if we've seen anything in Hervey, Hervey, Harvey, Irma, I mean, we can just smash those together. Herma. It's actually brought people together. And people are saying, as maybe as hokey and cliche as it seems, that is the real America. People will come together and help each other. It's all that divide and conquer. I believe it was the great Steven Tyler that once said, you know, you can put a bunch of little kids of different colors in a sandbox and they'll all play with each other until some asshole adult says, you know, that kid's different. The other bit in the breaking mainstream news, the iPhone X, no, oh, they're calling it the 10, is the one phone where you'll really want to wait for the reviews. Oh, you mean because it's a big rushed piece of crap from a radio station? File it under not unmitigated good news, but I believe Apple's stock tanked yesterday when during the big unveil event, their new biometric facial recognition unlock screen failed in front of everybody. So we can, I suppose, call that a little bit of not unmitigated good news, and that is that the biometric control grid is not exactly in place yet. What would a glance at the breaking lamestream news be without a quick fact check, my friends? Why is VAT charged on school uniforms, says the BBC? Asks the BBC, I should say. Explaining insane in the McCain's defense cut from fact check. Wisconsin guaranteeing nearly $3 billion to Foxconn with no job guarantees. Governor hopeful. That's PolitiFact. Woman dies in cinema while watching It remake. That's from Snopes. And Jennifer Aniston forgives Brad Pitt's story is fake news, and I kind of feel like we've read that fake news bit already. So there you go. Now there's a little bit of critical thinking for you from the powers that shouldn't be. And let's begin, shall we, because it's going to have some bad news in this Food World Order episode. How about we begin with a little bit of unmitigated good news? And it begins with Billy Caldwell. About once a day, 11-year-old Billy Caldwell could have pretty much expected to die. 30 times a month, he would have a massive seizure that would require massive doses of medication and oxygen masks just to survive that. Doctors were helpless. According to his parents, overmatched medical professionals sent him home from a hospital unhealed with a mortal warning he could die anytime. 
That's a terrible story, but a familiar one. See, and our buddy Chef Jake in the chat already knows. It's a familiar one in the cannabis world. And since this, grabbing it from a cannabis publication you might have heard of called High Times. It has the familiar happy ending that us in the cannabis community have always known. Earlier this year, after receiving a cannabis oil-based treatment in California, Billy Caldwell became the first person to receive a prescription for medical cannabis from the National Health Service. That's the United Kingdom's single-payer public health care system. This means Billy Caldwell enjoys at least two things very few Americans enjoy by themselves, public-funded health care and a medical marijuana prescription. And possibly no Americans enjoy those two things together. He also, by the way, hasn't had a single seizure in more than 300 days, his mom Charlotte told the Irish Independent this article published in High Times September 6th. P- posted by Chuberto420, if, if that is his real name. Billy is doing absolutely incredible, improving every week and making progress. I never anticipated a year ago that he would even still be here today, so I'm feeling really good and positive. That's the medical, the medical miracle of cannabis oil. And even High Times puts miracle in quotes because they know it's not a miracle when you've studied it and researched it and used it and known it for millennia. It's only a big miracle surprise to the lamestream world that we now live in. So that's a good way to start with a little bit of good news from High Times. And again, you can get that complete story. So everything we say will be in the show notes. So we go from High Times to the Tri-State update, and it ain't good. So meanwhile, cannabis pretty much curing seizures, curing cancer, fixing anything it comes in contact with. That's one story, but we can also run over to Ohio, where they still think it's 1830. There was a large open burn in Trumbull County. More than 330 marijuana plants were set ablaze. It's the most marijuana, the Trumbull County. Ashtabula Group Law Enforcement Task Force, TAG for short. It's the biggest burn they've ever been able to eradicate since 2014. Captain Tony Villanueva said the street value of the drug is approximately $332,000. So that doesn't actually sound like that much, buddy. Sounds like he probably could have used that money. Sounds like a lot of people probably could have used that money. Or the plants to do as they wish because we are sovereign human beings who can put whatever we want in our bodies. Thanks very much, Government Church. The marijuana roundup was just part of three days of TAG's 2017 eradication where a team of law enforcement agencies, including BCI, OSHP, you can only assume that's Ohio State Highway Patrol, and Trumbull and Ashtabula County Sheriff's Office searched by air and land for marijuana plants growing in those counties. So again, searching by air, that means they're wasting a bunch of oil to fly around in their little choppy copters looking for a plant. Hopefully their moms would look up in the sky and go, you're a disgrace. I'm embarrassed by you. A lot of this marijuana was grown on vacant property. Farmer's property. We have no idea who's planting this marijuana, but we know that it is illegally planted. Officials piled it all up, set it on fire, destroying the plants that could have made their way to the streets. Tag agents know they'll get a mixed reaction from the public about the eradication, but they still want to stress that marijuana is still illegal in Ohio, and these types of operations are important. We can't turn the other way when it comes to these types of investigations. That's actually what I asked the cops back in 1998 in Frederick, Maryland, when I got arrested for a gram of marijuana. I basically said, I was like, dude, do you think this is a really good use of your time? Well, you just keep trying. I'm like, oh, you're a moron. And that's how we begin our morning monarchy with the ups and downs of the cannabis world. And those are the kind of things that we'll talk about. When your Mary Jane report returns to the media monarchy airwaves, huge thanks to our buddy Mr. Chris. He's been very busy like us this summer. He's been moving and grooving in physically moving locations. You can check out his site at maryjane.report. You are streaming the morning monarchy. It's the hump day, food world order edition. It's Wednesday, September 13th, 2017, and I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. When Insys Therapeutics got approval to sell an ultra-powerful opioid for cancer patients with acute pain in 2012, it soon discovered a problem finding enough cancer patients to use the drug. So, of course, to boost the sales, 
The company allegedly took patients who didn't have cancer and made it look like they did. On Wednesday, Senator Claire McCaskill released a report on the findings of a congressional investigation into pharmaceutical company Insys Therapeutics. The jaw-dropping allegations detail the process in which agents systematically convinced insurers to pay for a highly addictive opioid cancer pain drug for patients who didn't have cancer. Insys's corrupt practices have led to a federal criminal indictment against six former executives on fraud and racketeering charges. McCaskill's office is leading an ongoing investigation into the complex web of deception that was allegedly employed by the company to trick insurance companies into covering the costs of a sprayable, powerful opioid called Subsys. What a racket. The drug maker used a combination of tactics such as falsifying medical records, misleading insurance companies, and providing kickbacks to doctors in league with the company, in cahoots with the company. According to a federal indictment, an ongoing in congressional investigation by the aforementioned Senator Claire McCaskill, a Democrat from Missouri. The new report, with links for you, goes to the document cloud. Fueling an epidemic, insist therapeutics. The new report by McCaskill's office released last Wednesday, that's a week ago today, includes allegations about just how far the company went to push prescriptions of its sprayable form of fentanyl, subsys, S-U-B-S-Y-S, S-Y-S, that's very funny, subsys. They would like you to subsist on their big pharma chemicals. They own the food companies and they own the drug companies. We are basically being manipulated like the poor plants in people's yards. A little GMO seeds, a little bit of Roundup. Because of the high costs associated with subsist, most insurers wouldn't pay for it unless it was approved in advance. That process, likely familiar to anyone who's gone through the revolving doors of the disease industry, they call it prior authorization. So... Insys set up an elaborate charade with employees that pretended to be doctor's offices. Employees that pretended to be doctor's offices. Hi, I'm an office. I don't know what that means there, fake news CNN. To fool insurance companies into approving the drug, Insys said in a statement provided to CNN last Wednesday that it disagreed with certain characterizations in the staff report. <laughs> Not a, a, a big denial. Uh, you know, certain characterizations are wrong. The report relates to activities of former employees of our company and matters that the company has addressed in its own efforts and in connection with investigations by the Department of Justice and State Attorney General's Office. You know, you guys, we've already been criminally investigated for all our crimes. We swept away the people who did bad stuff and gave them golden parachutes. And we're colluding with the highly corrupt Department of Justice. So, Senators, you guys can back off. Senate report documented how beginning in 2014, when someone needed to obtain prior approval for a subsys prescription, it was actually an NSYS employee who called the insurer and its affiliates to persuade them. The insurers thought they were talking to someone who worked for the actual patient's doctor, and the NSYS employees had a carefully crafted script designed to intentionally leave that impression. NSYS even went so far as to obscure its outgoing phone number on caller IDs so that calls wouldn't be traced back to the company. And if an insurer needed a phone number for a return call, company employees reportedly provided a 1-800 number, of course, run by another NSYS representative, instead of contact information for the prescribing physician. Vandalay Industries during such calls, there was usually a key question. Did the patient have acute pain caused by cancer, known as a breakthrough pain? Cancer was a requirement for prior clearance to, sub to prescribe subsis. Insys got around this little pesky question by finding calculated ways for its employees to create the impression on the phone calls that the answer was yes, they did have cancer, without explicitly saying so. A recording of such a call, obtained by McCaskill's investigators and released Wednesday. Oh, I don't have that for you shows the wordplay INSYS employees engaged in. The call involves a New Jersey woman named Sarah Fuller, who did not have cancer but was nevertheless prescribed subsys by her doctor. Fuller died last year of a subsys overdose, and state authorities later petitioned to have her doctor's license temporarily suspended. Good God. On the call, the INSYS employee began by saying she was with the office of Fuller's doctor and subsequently claimed she was calling from the doctor's office. It's an outright falsehood. She's not calling from the doctor's office, Ms. Caskell obviously told reporters last Wednesday. The INSYS employee is then heard suggesting she's, oh, I'm, I'm thumbing through your paperwork, trying to find the diagnosis in the, in, the, in the medical records. She casually drops the line, sounding as if she's reading from the patient's records. That subsys is, 
intended for the management of breakthrough cancer pain without explicitly saying Fuller herself has cancer. The Instas employee then tells the insurance representative that Fuller suffers from breakthrough pain, leaving out the words cancer. Later in the call, a different insurance representative asks flatly if the subsist will be used to treat breakthrough cancer pain or not, and the Instas employee first responds that there's no code for breakthrough cancer pain. When the representative for the insurance affiliate reiterates that he wanted to make sure that I heard you correctly, the INSYS employee tells him, quote, it's for breakthrough pain, yeah. Again, leaving out the word cancer. The company's president and CEO, Saeed Motahari, submitted a letter to congressional investigators dated September 1st to respond to McCaskill's probe. These mistakes and actions are not indicative of the people that are currently employed at INSYS. He wrote that they've completely transformed its employee base over the last several years and has actively taken the appropriate steps to place ethical standards of conduct and patient interests at the heart of our business decisions. Incense, meanwhile, is currently in the midst of an avalanche of criminal, criminal and civil legal trouble. In December, federal prosecutors in Boston criminally charged six former Incense executives, including its former CEO, with fraud and racketeering charges related to subsis. Prosecutors described a, quote, nationwide conspiracy to bribe medical practitioners to unnecessarily prescribe a fentanyl-based pain medication and defraud health care insurers. What a racket. I have the same sort of gut pushback rejection of this whole world, just like I've always felt pretty much about the military and about sports and about the church. I want nothing to do with this. I want to make sure that I can live my life that I don't have to ever darken your door. I don't want to ever have to come to your house and ask for your bullshit fixes. Do not invite the vampire into your house. They will come in. Oh, hey, what a nice place. They'll probably even hang out on your couch and chill out. <clears throat> I mentioned yesterday that I had the plumber and landlady over for several hours. Gosh, that was fun. Hope you're doing all right. We are streaming live. It is your morning monarchy. It's Wednesday, September 13th, 2017. I'm coming to you live from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in Portland, Oregon. Hope you're doing well whenever, wherever you are. If you're in a car, in a cube, in a garden, if you're listening live, if you're listening later, we appreciate you. We've been doing this for 12 years and two days. I'm going to keep doing that until that gets old. We haven't talked in a long time, and I haven't heard a lot of talk about it. You remember Codex Alimentarius? I've got an interesting opinion editorial on food safety news. And if you follow hashtag food world order, you will see that a lot of the stories originally come from food safety news. That gets you a lot of recall news. It's also a lot of food industrial news from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Because there's not a lot of food technology and genetically modified transgenic this and that that food safety news isn't all excited about. It's not unlike back in the day when we used to get a bunch of stories about the military industrial complex during the puppet Bush years. And my gosh, we got to get a lot of news from Danger Room and Threat Level over on Wired because they love this stuff. Moving the U.S. Codex Alimentarius office to the USDA trade is a big mistake. So says Brian Ron Holman. We'll read just a little bit of this. One significant provision in Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue's most recent realignment announcement would move the U.S. Codex Alimentarius office from the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, FSIS, to the newly created Trade and Foreign Agriculture Affairs, TFAA, office. While the move may seem inconsequential on the, surface, on the surface, this realignment will undermine the United States' credibility in the international food policy arena and represents yet another effort by the Trump administration to emphasize trade goals at the expense of food safety. Codex Alimentarius is a United Nations standard-setting body working under the auspices of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and the World Health Organization that establishes food standards that protect public health and ensure fair trade of safe food all over the world. Many countries incorporate Codex standards into their laws, which has the effect of upgrading international food safety efforts. Codex standards also establishes predictability for food traders and are used by the WTO in settling trade disputes. The U.S. Codex office is comprised of a small and very effective staff within FSIS that manages U.S. participation in Codex by engaging other federal agencies and external stakeholders in the development of these international governmental and non-governmental food standards. 
Historically, the United States has been a strong presence in Codex, providing leadership and maintaining the organization's adherence to science. Aligning the U.S. Codex Alimentarius Office with trade goals within the USDA will have a negative impact on this leadership status. Within Codex, the U.S. faces challenges from other countries who are attempting to impose views of appropriate food standards that are not supported by science. While the challenges from these other countries have been formidable, the U.S. Codex Office has been able to execute a strategic outreach program that has proven successful in gaining support for U.S. positions worldwide. Now, what are they talking about here? Seems like you're speaking a lot of coded language there, Brian Ronholm. Seems like those other countries have these weird standards that we don't want to do here in the States. We want everything genetically modified, and we want it run by the food pesticide companies, the big pharma food companies. Now, some of those crazy people across the pond have the idea that maybe untested transgenic technologies aren't exactly what you want to shove down your little kid's gullet. So it looks like it's gangsters battling over some turf here. It looks like the powers that shouldn't be that want to guide the food world order are again running up against some seeming brief roadblock in the form of America's next top president. So I'm just reading that onto the record and we'll continue to watch that. And if you have any updates or follow ups on this or any other thing we talk about in the media monarchy kingdom, we love and need the updates. You can always tweet them using the right hashtag or if you don't do any of that junk, you can always just email me, james at mediamonarchy.com. So one good turn deserves another. An appeals court granted a request this past Monday from America's next top president to halt a plan for new pollution controls at Utah's oldest coal-fired power plants aimed at reducing haze near national parks. The development marks a reversal for the EPA, which last year under Obama unveiled the rules and defended itself in a lawsuit brought by Utah and Rocky Mountain Power. The Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals approved EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt's request to halt that lawsuit while his agency revises a plan that called for new equipment to reduce nitrogen oxide emissions at two coal plants in Emory County. Environmental and clean air groups expressed dismay over the decision Monday that they say rejects EPA's own research that showed the plan would have cut down haze near eastern Utah's Arches and Canyonlands National Parks, in addition to other conservation and wilderness areas. The move by the EPA wasn't a surprise. While visiting Salt Lake City and meeting with Republican Governor Gary Herbert in July, Pruitt said his agency was reconsidering the plan. The move is part of a troubling nation, national rollback of key environmental protections by the Trump administration, said Michael Shea, a senior policy associate with the clean air group Heal Utah. We all knew things that were going to be bad, and this is the kind of the first big hit that Utah has taken as far as the rollback. This is a loss for not only the environmental movement, but for anybody who loves Utah's national park. But the flip side of this is I believe Utah has pretty much some of the worst air in America already anyway. By January 2010, it was official. Northern Utah had been labeled with the worst air quality in the nation, exceeding all federal standards of particulate pollution. The federal government's air quality website, Air Now, ranks the top five worst places in the United States for air quality. And in January 2010, all five were located in Utah. Salt Lake City, Ogden, Provo, Logan, and the Washakie Indian Reservation near the Utah-Idaho border all made the list. Air is considered deteriorating when the index for particulate pollution reaches over 35. For several days in January 2010, Salt Lake City's air quality index rated 142, as compared to 67 for San Francisco and 23 for Las Vegas. But Utah state officials and Rocky Mountain Power said they're pleased the state's plan can be reconsidered. They opposed the federal plan. They said they'd have to cost about $700 million, which of course would have been passed on to the sucker customers without cutting emissions and improving visibility. Dave McNeil, planning manager with the Utah Division of Air Quality, said the state worked for years to develop its own plan in coordination with regional EPA officials, who says were surprised when officials at EPA headquarters spiked the plan and called for new equipment. There's a lot of scientific data that was basically ignored in the old administration. It was a war on coal issue that the old administration was going through, so in another situation you have... Little mineral manager cronies battling over turf, battling over crumbs. They're battling over the crumbs that they might throw us. 
So no sweat, Utah. You get a free pass. Don't worry. You guys can pollute however you want because that's going to be part of making America great again. Just like they're doing down in the aforementioned America's Wang. State and federal environmental regulators issued a blanket waiver on Monday. Oh, was that the same day that they did it in Utah? An appeals court granted a request on Monday. Yep, sure is. So Monday was a busy day for undoing anything that the powers that shouldn't be would like to do. Because as Mossad Rahm Emanuel has said, of course, never let a crisis go to waste. State and federal environmental regulators issued a blanket waiver on Monday for Florida electric companies to violate clean air and water standards without penalty for the next two weeks. Oh, you guys you probably could have come up with a funny, like, purge name. Uh, penalty purge? We'll have to work on that. EPA said the so-called no-action assurance granted through September 26 came at the request of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. The letter said the move will provide America's Wang utility generators needed flexibility to maintain and restore electricity supplies in the wake of Hurricane Irma. The EPA said the move was in the public's interest. Florida's Division of Emergency Management said about noon on Monday that 6.52 million utility customers in the state were without power. That's more than 65% of all electricity companies. Customers, rather. The EPA's assurance letter will allow utilities to operate outside restrictions mandated by their permits, including potentially using dirtier fuels, running for longer hours, or electively bypassing pollution control equipment. Coal-fired power plants can also discharge wastewater laced with levels of toxic heavy metals at higher concentrations than what would normally be permitted. Because, you know, they allow certain allowable levels of filth, you know, like in your hot dogs and cigarettes. The utilities are still required to monitor and report the levels of regulated contaminants in their air emissions and water discharges according to the letter. So you have to keep track of it, it just doesn't matter. The Associated Press reported last week that air pollution levels spiked in the Houston area after a similar enforcement a waiver was granted to Texas petrochemical facilities ahead of Hurricane Harvey's arrival. And the one comment at the bottom of this page basically says something we already know, that Scott Pruitt, the new head of the EPA under America's Next Top President, has been trying to dismantle the EPA and all its progress to so-called protect the environment. Please don't throw me into the briar patch. Please, government, give me the permission to do what I'd like with my own body and on my own land. And the government says, nope, not going to happen. Now, again, we're not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. We get our news from you. And on Wednesdays, we get it from hashtag food world order. We had a friend, Socor, in the chat actually a couple of days trying to rally the troops and get the word out about something going down in Iowa. Now, we talk a lot about Iowa, and there have been a lot of fantastic food moves made in Iowa. Our buddy Bo Boai has a farm over in Iowa. We had a friend of his, actually. I've never even talked about her. I haven't even actually mentioned this, and I, as long as I'm rustling around in all my papers for sound effects on this episode. Kate Smith, not the famous opera singer, but Kate Smith, a friend of Bo, of ours in Iowa. She sent me a series of postcards over the summer from Omaha and from Nebraska, in Florence and basically talking about all kinds of success of what they were building, essentially community food organizations in Iowa. So all the while those positive things are happening, there is one situation with a farm called Versa Land, V-E-R-S-A-L-A-N-D, Versaland.com. They are basically being shut down by the state. Hey everyone, my name is Grant Schultz. I farm at Versa Land, which is 143 acres of Diverse organic crops in Iowa City, Iowa. Raise everything from apples and chestnuts to pastured livestock. And at the present moment, I'm currently under assault by the Johnson County, Iowa Planning and Zoning Department. In the last year, they've banned retail orchards, which means crops like this can't be harvested in a UPIC operation with any sort of agritourism or, or value-added products on hand. Um, I can't have any farm worker housing outside of a tight June 1 to September 15th uh, window, and that has to be applied for every year, which means when all these crops are ripe, I can't have any farm workers living on site for, uh, for harvest help. When it's planting season, come uh, April and May for vegetable crops, I can't have any interns, can't have any employees living on site. Um, for a county that's supposedly so progressive, uh, all their policies are just anti-agriculture, anti-diversity, anti-anything uh, for that matter. And furthermore, uh, recently I have some designs to put in some farm ponds for aquaculture, for fishing on site. 
And uh, staff has stated that unless I have AR zoning, um, I can't sell worms for people to fish on my Iowa farm. It's pretty crazy. Um, they're saying that aquaculture is not agriculture. Shut up, slave. Aquaculture isn't agriculture. It's culture when we tell you it's culture, because we're the state. So there is actually a complete, it's probably about a half hour long video that gets into all of that. Nazi County, Iowa makes growing food on small farms illegal. Farmer blackmailed. Regenerative Agriculture is originally the YouTube channel that posted that video. He's trying to spread the word about a smaller farmer who doesn't actually have the YouTube coverage that he has. So again, that will be included in the show notes. And a huge thank to SoCor for spreading inf information that we all need. That we can use out here on the ground in our lives. And all of these things, especially on Food World Order Day, it all comes down to your medicine cabinet should be your refrigerator. And vice versa. Now, it shouldn't be much of a surprise that we are probably relocating the Media Monarchy Enterprises within the next year and also the whole family. We got to get closer to Cassie's parents and she lives down and they live down in New Mexico. So we've pretty much been looking that it's probably Colorado, maybe, but probably New Mexico. And once that happens, of course, I start to see all the New Mexico stories like they've got plague. You know, fun stuff like that. So let's file another one on the oh, my God, what am I doing? A wealthy Italian family, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm interested so far. A wealthy Italian family hopes to serve future water demand in urban New Mexico by pumping ancient groundwater from an arid plain some 150 miles away. The plan, uncannily similar to California's Cadiz project, where a wealthy landowner plans to pump ancient Mojave Desert groundwater to serve the LA metro area. That project recently won an important policy rollback from the previously mentioned... America's Next Top President Administration, which could make construction much more likely. In New Mexico, Augustine Plains Ranch proposes to pump groundwater from rural Catrone County north to sprawling Albuquerque, the state's population hub. Its application with the state engineer calls for pumping 54,000 acre feet annually from depths of some 1,500 feet in the aquifer. That's enough to meet the annual needs of 110,000 average households. That $600 million project includes 37 new wells and a 54-inch pipeline running 140 miles to the Albuquerque region. Catrone County has fewer than 4,000 residents, many of whom, as you might imagine, depend on water. For their livestock industry, for their livelihoods, the industry in turn depends on relatively shallow groundwater wells to serve homes and animals. As a result, residents like Anita Hand see the distinct threat in the groundwater extraction project. Hand, a cattle rancher whose land borders the Augustan Plains properties, fears it will rapidly drain the water table, leaving their small wells dry. Some of these water wells we've had since the 1920s and some even earlier than that, said Hand, also a Catrone County commissioner and board member of the San Augustin Water Coalition, which opposes the pumping plan. All of a sudden, this foreign entity can come in and pump out water and we're left with nothing. Without water, our livelihood is done. New Mexico Tech University is in the midst of a major study of the Augustan Plains groundwater basin. A final report is expected by the end of this year. Preliminary work found that the water in the aquifer is 11,000 years old on average. It accumulated at a time when the climate was different, when heavy snowfall in the region was common. It also found there's been little to no recharge of the aquifer since then. Hand suggests this won't be, there won't be any second chances if the project drains the aquifer significantly. So this article does go on from News Deeply, which is not a place we've gotten news stories before, but that's the great part about independent non-commercial alternative media. An absentee property owner aims to tap ancient groundwater for delivery to Breaking Bad Town, but ranchers in the arid valley worry it's going to dry up their livelihood and the water might never return. So from good water to grody-ass water, well, you know, it's the land of, you know, the big... British smiles, so I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that we are hitting the tip of the fatberg. You may have seen that word trending recently. British engineers say they have launched a sewer war against a giant fat blob clogging London sewers. Tim's water official said Tuesday it's likely to take three weeks to dissolve the outsized fatberg. Now, it's interesting when a news article, again, the Associated Press, just starts using a new made-up word and doesn't really introduce it to you. 
They caution against expecting quick results as the Fatberg is 250 yards long and weighs as much as 11 double-decker buses. The unsavory blob consists of congealed wet wipes, diapers, fat, and oil. Tim's Water's Matt Rimmer says the Fatberg is, quote, a total monster and taking a lot of manpower and machinery to remove as it's set hard. He said the task is basically like trying to break up concrete. Eight workers are using high-powered jet hoses to break up the blob before sucking it out into tankers for disposal at a recycling plant. Now, this story got a lot of coverage because it's bizarre and it's weird and it's gross, and that's what the internet likes a lot of times. So even one of our local news stations, again, we rage on this a lot. I don't go to Portland News to read about weird things in London sewers. I need to know what's going on in my town, dummies. And you're just doing rip and read Associated Press reports. So it's possible this article over on K2 is exactly, yep, it's, it's the exact same article. The internet loves that. No, wait, I'm sorry. The internet doesn't care. It's corporate media that loves that. And that's what I've talked about. And that's what I really saw in my time at the commercial radio station was, oh, corporate media needs everybody back on the same page discussing the, the same three stories. You know what color that dress is, that kind of garbage. Interestingly enough, and maybe this is why they didn't have to explain the word fatberg, much like we see in the news world, it's not actually new. Let's go back three years to the BBC. Here we are, this is the River Fleet. It looks like a sewer, smells like a sewer. Woo! That's because it is a sewer. Back in the early 19th century, the Open River Fleet was essentially a cesspit carrying disease through London. So it was decided to cover it up and using 318 million bricks, Victorian engineers turned it into this. It means that millions of us can now live without the risk of disease in a few square miles. But it also hides some pretty gruesome surprises. Dave Dennis is one of an army of underground workers that keep the fleet flowing. Surely one of the least enviable jobs in Britain. So this is the main sewer tunnel. Are there tributary sewer tunnels that come off it or is this it? Yeah, yeah, there's loads. Obviously, down small, very small side roads, you get a main sewer, each yeah. one, and they drop into a trunk sewer, okay. which, is, which we're standing in. And if you look over here, there's a small junction, which basically is a small sewer. What comes out of here? This is human waste. Straight from the toilet, that Straight is. Straight from yeah. the toilet. Direct from the toilet. Man. Direct from the customer. Oh, oh the no. smell. Yeah, I know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Every underground labyrinth has its monster, as I'm about to discover. Down here, it's not a minotaur. It's something far, far worse. Oh, God. Oh, the stink. Oh my God, that is horrendous. Is this white stuff just fat? This is pure fat that's solidified oh, with other God, material. It's come from all over London and it congeals here because it's a bit of a bottleneck. Right. So you have to come down and just break we it up? We have to come down and break it up okay. uh, for it to flow downstream. Down here lives the Fatberg, a mixture of rancid fat, human excrement and other unmentionables. Oh Christ. You all right? <laughs> Do you want to get out, Dallas? Oh, God, the smell. Oh. Look at the size of that. This is a... Uh, so this, this is, this is, this a, is fat a fat bug. bug. Look at the size of Look it. The worms in it. It's got worms in it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could have prepared me for the overpowering smell. <laughs> you want the what do you have for breakfast? <laughs> yeah, we might see it. <laughs> well, this is one big burg. Where does that break on the burg scale? That's a, is that a big one? Pretty good one, yeah. Oop. It's breaking up quite nicely though. Shall I give a stick Yeah, give it a, give it a cut out. This is worm heaven. So, what the hell is that? God knows. I don't even want to know what that is. <laughs> this is the most disgusting thing I've ever done in my life without a shadow of effect. Yeah, the worst thing is, yeah, getting a bit of splash back and getting it in your mouth. 
So when you guys say, actually, please don't pour fat down your sink, you actually yeah, mean, it, don't, please, it, don't can you really it? Yeah, not yeah. pour fat down your sink? What begins as an innocent bit of grease in your kitchen can quickly transform into the monster fatberg. This is a job I don't want to repeat anytime soon. If you are up for it, you can actually watch that video and see the visuals. And of course, it's funny to hear the longtime worker giggling and laughing at the guy who can't handle inhaling a bunch of nasty, nasty nastiness. Home stretch here on your Food World Order Morning Monarchy as fast food titans like Mickey D's attempts to lure dummies with increasingly gigantic burgers. One soon to be chain is putting its money on a more plant based approach. Northern California based Amy's Drive Thru, hailed as America's first meat free fast food restaurant, is preparing to spread its organic vegetarian menu across the U.S. as Fast Company is reporting. And Amy's themselves have liked my tweets in regards to this story. Many will recognize the Amy's brand from the frozen food aisle, pizzas, burritos, and other organic, frequently meatless entrees under the Amy's Kitchen name. You might remember, because I've mentioned it here, as we've talked about all the sellout food companies, Amy's Kitchen has not sold out. They are an independent food company. They have maintained their independence. So when I saw the story that they're going to get into the fast food world, I was like, you guys, please be careful. I don't want to see you put all your eggs, so to speak, in this basket and then have to give it all up and then sell out. But corporate media and fake news morning shows that have four dummies all standing out in the line and basically saying the same things, they're all super excited. One of America's most guilty pleasures is fast food. But do you have to feel guilty? Amy's drive through is an organic, vegetarian, non-GMO fast food restaurant, and they have plans to take over the U.S., aiming to become the first national vegetarian drive through fast food chain. The company opened its first location two years ago in Rohnert Park, California. California, and business has been booming ever since. It can be tough to find fast food options out there that conform to the standards we set for ourselves. If you're a vegetarian or simply need gluten-free options, it can be difficult to find anywhere that actually fits within the confines of your diet. That's why the California-based Amy's drive through is such an interesting location. It's the first organic, vegetarian, gluten-free, optional fast food chain in America. And business is doing so well that the restaurant is looking into becoming a chain that will spread across the country. So we'll see how that goes. And actually, I misspoke. Jerkass James misspoke. That's not the clip that has the goofy news people saying the same exact thing. That's coming up in just a couple of moments as we start to wrap up and we go into lightning round here on your Food World Order headlines. Hey, in this just in. In this morning, many of us spend our days sitting down. But a new study says this could lead to an earlier death depending on how long you sit. Now, according to the study by the Annals of Internal Medicine, sitting for more than 60 to 90 consecutive minutes increased the risk of death. Now, that is regardless of how much a person exercises. Doctors say to reduce the harmful consequences of sitting down too long, you should get up and move around every 30 minutes. I generally do try and get up and move around every 30 minutes, even though now working from home, of course, it does make me kind of set up here in the desk station. You might know that I'm kind of a fidgety, antsy dude. So even as we speak, even as this clip came up, it's like, oh, that's right. I kind of get up and... I more kind of sit and squat on my seat. So I'm actually up on my feet right now. And there were a handful of people back at the commercial radio station. Of course, they were made fun of because they're weird and stupid and different. Who had their desks fixed to where it was a stand-up desk. So they did their news editing and things at a stand-up desk. Hey, surprise, surprise, that guy didn't last there long. Zurich-based, world-leading confectionery company, Barry Calabau has created a pink-hued chocolate that it claims is the first new natural chocolate color since the white variety was introduced 80 years ago. Now, don't get triggered about white chocolate. They call it ruby chocolate. It's made from the ruby cocoa bean, which gives it a natural pinkish color and a, quote, fresh berry fruitiness, the company said in a statement. The new chocolate is a result of more than a decade's research and development. Mmm, nothing sounds delicious like R&D. 
On the Ruby Bean, Calibo's Chief Innovation and Quality Officer Peter Boone told the press when the product was revealed at a launch event in Shanghai last Wednesday, here's the part where all the news people sound the same. By this morning, the universe now has more chocolate to enjoy. There is milk chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate, and now a new one. Swiss chocolatiers say the new Ruby chocolate has a natural berry-like flavor and an unusual pink color. The new chocolates are targeted at millennials who enjoy a hedonistic mm. indulgence. I, I resent that. The Ruby chocolate <laughs> could be in stores in about six months. I'm all for the chocolate. I don't know about hedonistic. Right, dark Make chocolate. It, yeah. I don't Why want any it? pink chocolate. Huh? Is it hedonistic? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Chocolate lovers, you will soon have a new flavor to choose from. <laughs> yep, you've got milk, dark, white, and now ruby chocolate. Scientists invented the chocolate, which has a reddish pink hue and a berry fruitiness-like flavor. Scientists. Yeah. Made from <laughs> the ruby cocoa bean, has no berry flavoring or color added. Sounds good. I'd try it. I'd try it. Conan O'Brien's pushing the envelope. Finally here on your Food World Order episode, we make the perfect transition to Thursday's Holy Hexes news because tourists visiting a church in the picturesque French town of Chateau Chalon were surprised to discover that local pranksters had replaced the font's holy water with alcohol. A dozen tourists sniffed out the telltale signs of eau de vie, a clear fruit brandy, when they visited the church at the end of August. I made the sign of the cross and it smelled like eau de vie. Is this a local tradition? The tourists asked officials at the nearby visitor center. The inquiries prompted the authorities to carry out an impromptu investigation. <laughs> A liter of brandy had been poured into both the fonts. You really smelt the alcohol when you walked into the church. The church is not regularly used for mass and the fonts are usually empty. The two fonts were immediately drained and cleaned before being filled with more traditional holy water ahead of a festival the following day. The identity of the pranksters and their intentions remains unknown. Village Mayor Christian Villuame said it was clearly a joke. Clearly, because the liquor was clear. <laughs> I get it. It made me laugh. I think the people who did it have a sense of humor and wanted to break with tradition, but I don't think everyone was amused. However, we were highly amused here on your Food World Order, and all those stories will be included in your show notes, and they are all brought to you by you. Huge thanks to Dr. Mrs. Girlfriend, Eric Mosha, Nicole Redu, Socor, Keith Johnson, and everybody else who shares, shares the news with us. That's how we learn. That's how we keep going forward. One of our favorite bands, and one of the reasons they're our favorites, is because they are pretty prolific. And we've already been playing new music from them, following up a new album that just came out like two months ago. California dance punkers Chick Chick Chick, you might know them as three exclamation points. They've already got a brand new tour support EP called Shake the Shut Up. And we're going to listen to a brand new song called The Long Walk in just a few minutes. But of course, let's take a stroll down this day in history. Past is prologue September 13th, 1862. Union soldiers find a copy of Robert E. Lee's battle plans in a field outside goddamn Frederick, Maryland. It is the prelude to the Battle of Antietam. September 13th, 1898. Hannibal Goodwin patents celluloid photographic film. 1899. Henry Bliss... Such a great name for his bad place in history. He's the first person in America to be killed in a car accident. September 13th, 1953, as we jump ahead, Nikita Khrushchev is appointed General Secretary of the Commie Party of the Soviet Union. 1971, state police and National Guardsmen storm New York's Attica Prison to quell a prison riot. That same day, September 13, 1971, Chairman Mao Zedong's second-in-command and successor, Marshal Lin Bao, flees the People's Republic of China after the failure of an alleged coup. Whoops, his plane crashes in Mongolia, killing all on board. That sure is a shame when you were trying to flee. September 13, 1985, Super Mario Bros. is released in Japan for the NES, which starts the Super Mario series of platforming games. September 13th, 1988. Oh my god, you guys stopped the presses. Apparently, a bunch of hurricanes and weather happen right around now. Hello, Hollywood? Hurricane Gilbert is the strongest recorded hurricane in the Western Hemisphere, later replaced by Hurricane Wilma in 2005. September 13th, 1993, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin shakes hands with Palestine Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat at the White House after signing the Oslo Accords, granting limited Palestinian autonomy. How's that working out for you? September 13th, 1996. 
I remember exactly where I was when I heard the announcement come out of a car stereo. Hip-hop star Tupac Shakur dies on September of gunshot wounds suffered in a Las Vegas drive-by shooting. Near fatal shooting, but he couldn't survive a second. Rap star Tupac Shakur died last night after a brief life in a rough business. He was 25. Here's NBC's Stan Bernard. Tupac Shakur rode to fame and riches on his often violent vision of life in the inner city. That vision turned out to be prophetic. His own death from multiple gunshot wounds. And his devoted fans who believed his rap litany mirrored their lives are mourning. I like rappers who are going to say what they have to say. You know, I really like that. He didn't hold nothing back. He didn't bite his tongue. But like I said, Tupac took things a little bit too far. And that could be the reason why he is where he is right now. For many, Shakur's reputation as a gifted rap artist was more important than his history, his rap sheet. When he was shot in this car in Las Vegas, he was out on bail while appealing a four and a half year sentence for sexual assault. And he had been shot before when someone, he said, tried to rob him. But Shakur, who was also an actor, said in a recent interview, the harsh realities of his life made him different from other performers. No one alive, I think, with sanity has as much life experience to draw from. And I think that's the only thing that, that breaks me apart from the pack. And his early death underlines another terrible reality, the early mortality of black men. A lot of us are still trying to figure out who we are, and when you have to try to figure out who you are inside of a public limelight like the way he did, it's very, very difficult. It seems the rain will never let up, I try to keep my head up, and still keep from getting wetter. Tupac Shakur, perhaps personified by the words thug life tattooed on his stomach, said his success was due to his life and his career being so closely intertwined. Stan Bernard, NBC News, New York. I was sitting out on the curb out in front of Gardner Hall, where I lived on college campus, going to Shepherd College. At the time, it was still a college. It's actually now a university. And I was sitting out on the curb, smoking a cigarette, on the late, late evening of September 12th. And it was early in the hours. And again, this would be East Coast. So, of course, we're getting all the news first. Sitting there smoking a cigarette. And I hear it coming out of the car stereo of a car sitting there idling. It's like Tupac has died. I'm like, damn, buddy. And that was Brian Williams in some ways with a well recited place, a brief life in a rough business. Continuing to look at this day in history, September 13th, 2001, civilian aircraft traffic resumes in the United States after 9-11, of course not counting all the bin Laden family members that the Bush crime family let flee America. They were allowed to leave, but you dummies weren't. September 13th, 2008, this just in, Hurricane Ike makes landfall on the Texas Gulf Coast of the United States, causing heavy damage to, huh, Galveston, Houston, and surrounding areas. Really interesting. Huh, they should probably look into that. Published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today. Take a deep breath. Paranoid predictions, false flag freakouts, stand down speculations. What was going on with the broken arrow? Remember, the missiles flew across America. Another classic move from the Bush crime family. That's been published to Media Monarchy decade ago today, Pentagon releases edited interview with 9-11 Mastermind. The Pentagon released an audio tape of a closed court session with the suspected mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, and the words of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed have been censored and redacted. Mystery 9-11 aircraft was military doomsday plane shortly before 10 a.m. on the morning of 9-11 amid rumors of a fourth hijacked plane headed for D.C. A mystery aircraft appeared in restricted airspace over the White House. Don't worry, that's just the doomsday plane. Also published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, oil and money, dollar hits all-time low against the euro. We also had Ron Paul for President 2.0, Putin dissolves Russian government, Russia tests super strength bomb, Fidel Castro says U.S. fooled world over 9-11, do you believe Bush's actions justify impeachment, and finally the talk of Tokyo, Japan's Abe resigns. Now, I believe that was a question, because I don't know that Abe actually did resign, but those are the stories published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today, as we have been around for 12 years and two days. Celebrating birthdays today, always an interesting batch. Love the synchronicities, love the synchromysticism of the birthdays in this day in history, and that's why we do it. September 13th, 
famed German pianist and composer, and one of the early masters of the theremin, Clara Schumann. We've actually played some of her very creepy, amazing theremin work before. His name's slapped across the hospital. Walter Reed, born on this day in 1851. Milton S. Hershey, founder of the Hershey Company, born on this day in 1857. John J. Pershing, famous general and lawyer from the American War Machine. It's also Austrian composer and painter Arnold Schoenberg. Claudette Colbert's birthday. Bill Monroe, country folk music legend. It's also Ray Charles' birthday, except not that Ray Charles. It's the Ray Charles who worked for that Ray Charles. That's really strange. Maurice Jarre, born on this day. The Velvet Fog, Mel Torme. Animation pioneer Don Bluth, Jacqueline Bissett, Chicago's Peter Cetera. The late great Nell Carter, designing women's Jean Smart. Randy Jones from The Village People. Producer Don Was. Steve Kilby from The Church. The late great Joni Sledge from Sister Sledge. She actually passed away earlier this year. Drummer Vinnie Peace. Megadeth's Dave's Mustaine. Tavis Smiley. Ringo's son, Zach Starkey. It's also Tim Ripper Owen's birthday, Tyler Perry's birthday, Stella McCartney, Fiona Apple, who actually just played a concert the other day. Cassie was super excited about it, shared the link with her. Played a show, well, I think it's one of her first shows in a while, premieres a new song, gets so happy that the audience sings her happy birthday, she actually does cartwheels on the stage. Fiona Apple fans might want to check that out. It's also Swizz Beat's birthday. And we'll see. I think probably for a Wednesday, I'm going to guess that maybe Bill Monroe might make it into your daily DJ set at noon. That's right, you get an hour-long morning monarchy each and every morning and a daily DJ set at noon. We call it Pump Up the THA Volume. And to wet that whistle, as I like to say, we'll go out today with more brand new music from the unstoppable Chick Chick Chick. They are three exclamation marks, and if you see that they're coming to a town and club near you, a media monarchy highly request that you go see them they are a long-running independent dance band good time so we're going out brand new music from chick 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 it's called the long walk thus concluding the food world order edition of your morning monarchy guys it's wednesday september 13th 2017 and i am indeed james evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. again thanking you so very much for taking part and listening and spreading the word and being interested and activated like i used to say get active or get radioactive but I'd like to remind you in the close of these episodes, like Jelly Biafra said, like he named one of his spoken word albums, like we made at our motto, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.